Hello and welcome to Bloke on the Range. In fact, today's video isn't about this Lee Enfield number no. four that you see before you, but about its final ultimate successor in nominally military service. Now, it was obviously replaced in frontline infantry service with uh, the L1A1 and C1 SLR throughout the Commonwealth. Um, it soldiered on as a sniper rifle, unconverted into, uh, into the 60s and 70s, underwent a conversion program to 762 NATO with heavy barrels, the uh, L L42 program, that soldiered on into the early 90s when it was replaced by um, the Exeter International L96 sniper rifle. And uh, it is in fact soldiered on in Canadian Ranger service until now. And it's currently in the process of being replaced by the military version of what is in this box here, which we'll get to in a moment. Now the Canadian Rangers are a 5,000 strong uh, unit of the Canadian Reserves. Uh, they are uniformed with a uh, red hooded top rather than uh, full camouflage. Now they trace their history back to 1942 when the uh, Pacific Coast Militia Rangers were set up to patrol remote parts of the Canadian Pacific Coast to guard against Japanese incursions, setting up of uh, weather stations, that sort of thing. Uh, initially they were armed with a hodgepodge of whatever they had on hand. Various Winchester rifles were uh, acquired from the States and uh, distributed. Apparently at the time one of the most common cartridges in use uh, in that part of the world was 3030, so it made sense to acquire rifles in that cartridge given that it was kicking around. And then when uh, when number fours became available they were progressively uh, introduced and apparently from 1947 onwards all the rangers were uh, armed with number fours. Now since the last number fours rolled off Canadian production lines in the 50s they are now in 2019, uh, getting rather long in the tooth. Uh, parts have been uh, running out, and apparently rifles have been cannibalized for parts significantly just to keep them running. Um, so it's sensible time to uh, to replace them with something modern where there can be full, uh, full parts and spares support, and uh, something a bit more capable under, under modern terms. Now, what's interesting is that this parallels exactly the situation with the Lee Enfield number no. 8 rifles, which are 22 training rifles still in British cadet service, or currently being phased out of cadet service, and the problem was parts and spares. Um, getting people to make up the relatively small numbers of spares at a sensible price, well, it's not going to happen, with rifles that have had zillions of rounds through them. So. Uh, the UK decided to adopt a uh, Savage designed uh, cadet target rifle, 22 rimfire. That is a whole story in and of itself, and once at some point when I'm uh, over in the UK I'll get one in my hands. Let's just say that the, 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 that does not seem to be anywhere near as successful as what's going on in here. So the Canadians carried out rifle trials, and one of the interesting parts of Canadian uh, uh, arms procurement is that whoever wins a trial has to agree to a Canadian manufacturer manufacturing their product, which uh, is not always acceptable to a lot of manufacturers. So in the end, it was won by Tika, and uh, they consented to their rifles being produced by Colt Canada. Um, they also produced them in Finland by Seiko, who own Tika, for the, for the civilian market. Now, the Canadians put a certain stipulation uh, that, the, uh, that the rifles couldn't be identical, so the stock is a different color, uh, they're marked up Tika, uh, they're not made by Colt Canada, and uh, yeah, so it's available to civilians, and uh, we'll talk about price and so on once I've opened the box, because it's not often I get to do an unboxing, because uh, normally I, uh, I buy old guns that just come like this, in a plastic bag. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring it forward to the camera, and we'll show you what you get with it, contrast what the Canadian Rangers get with theirs, show you the differences, we'll have a look at the mechanics, and uh, afterwards we'll have a little uh, chat about what's going on. Right, first of all, full disclosure, I have in fact had this out of the packaging. Uh, I put it back in because uh, it's nice to see how, uh, how it goes. Now, uh, for a rifle of this price, I think that a uh, cardboard box like this is a bit suboptimal. Wish they had done something a little more appropriate. So, difficult to get it all in sh shot here. So we have a manual some stickers and advertising, a pair of quick release sling swivels, a pair of screwdrivers, and why couldn't they have done a combi tool? These are just off the shelf screwdrivers for adjusting sights and yeah, we'll get onto them in a minute. Some screws, again, we'll get onto that. Th 
three aluminium butt spacers. And then the business end, we have quite a nifty packaging here. We have a bolt. Like so. And we have a rifle. So this is how it comes. Now this is just uh, here as a bit of a uh, packaging, this remove before firing. So what we've got is a uh, kind of brown and orange laminate stock. Now on the real C19s, this is red rather than orange, and uh, there's Canadian Rangers logo on there. Now we've got a nice uh, soft rubber butt pad. The length of pull on this is already quite long, uh, but it can be extended with uh, various spacers, and you get two small ones and one big one, and uh, the screws are extra long in case you want to put long, uh, a long, longer butt on it. We have a magazine, 10 round, double stack, single feed magazine with an ambidextrous release. Bedding screws are Torx heads and they didn't provide a screwdriver for doing them. Fore end is, uh, in fact, it's a standard Tika stock just in a different color. It's, uh, it's deeply checkered. It's got a reasonable, um, reasonable size on it. It's not too different from the number four, although it does taper in, uh, in sporter style. It's got a mid-weight sort of tactical barrel on it. And then the interesting bit is the sights. So we have a, a nice well-protected front sight, elevation adjustable with a screw and uh, this screwdriver. The muzzle is in fact threaded 5 8 slash 24 turns per inch and the, uh, the front sight block is keyed on so that it always has the correct vertical alignment. Right, on the top now, there's an integral 17 millimeter rail on the top of the receiver. And uh, on top of that, they've put a length of Picatinny. Now, if you buy one of the other Tika rifles, this will go all the way back. But here, you've got uh, the, uh, the rear sight on the 17 millimeter rail, so the Picatinny is shorter. Now, the Canadian Rangers are allowed to use their rifles for private hunting, uh, so this enables them to put scopes, optics on without taking off uh, the rear sight, which is about as low as it's feasible to get it. So the rear sight is elevation adjustable from 100 to 600 meters by pushing down on that turret, and then you've got six apertures at different heights. Now the 100 meter aperture is larger, nice uh, ghost ring style. All the others from 200 to 600 are smaller, and uh, you've got these Castellations on the top here to make it easy to uh, to adjust with gloved hands. Now I presume that they're sighted for the ammunition that's provided for them, which is a 180 grain nozzle AccuBond loaded in uh, an ammunition plant in Quebec. Um, we'll have to see on the range. What I think I will do is I will set it at 300 for 168 grain uh, factory match ammo. The locking's pretty positive. There's a there's a little play there. I wonder what'll happen with that. This, we'll, we'll see if that causes a little bit of a uh, windage group split. So to adjust for windage, you, uh, you loosen on one side, tighten the other, and uh, clicks front and back are apparently seven millimeters at 100 meters, which is about a quarter of a minute of angle, more or less. Now bolt-wise, this is a pretty typical modern style of bolt. It's a two locking lugs, and this, uh, I haven't fired this gun yet, it's been proof fired only. Um, plunger ejector, uh, extractor, recessed, push feed, this is uh, pretty standard for these days. And a uh, little tangent, I, uh, I dislike people calling anything with uh, two opposed locking lugs a Mauser type, because two opposed locking lugs predates Mauser using two opposed locking lugs. I mean, uh, he wasn't even second, he was third. Uh, this has got a plain bolt body, so it's more uh, pre-Mauser Gewehr 88 style. Typical shroud at the back with uh, a cocking indicator. The bolt handle is solid stainless steel and it's keyed in like that. You can uh, change these out. And uh, this goes in 
in the conventional manner and it's like greased lightning. What's also interesting is that the bolt throw is only 60 degrees. Despite, the, uh, despite it being two lugs and not three, it's 60 degrees. Bolt handle is bent back a bit, bringing, uh, bringing it level with the trigger. Now in a Lee Enfield, it's a little bit further back, it's level with the back of the trigger guard. This has a big trigger guard for gloved hands. Now the safety catch is quite interesting. That's fire, that's safe, locks the bolt. But if you press that little lever there, that unlocks the bolt. So you can, uh, you can safely unload your rifle without ever having, having the rifle in the condition where it can fire. And that, that little lever pops back up once you close the bolt. The trigger is, uh, is adjustable internally. It's factory set for about a kilo and a half, about three pounds, and it breaks like a glass rod. It's uh, really very impressive. Now as a rapid fire fan, I really value bolts that are smooth, and this runs like it's on rollers. I've never seen anything like this. I haven't lubed this, I haven't cleaned this. This is just how it came from the factory. So that's the mechanics of it. Now, uh, what's sort of the purpose of it? For, for, for me, personally, I like shooting iron sights. I'm not a massive scope fan. There are very few rifles out there on the market of any quality with decent iron sights. Um, I had a play with a Mossberg MVP in a very similar configuration. Um, it was horrible in comparison. There's the Ruger GSR, which was also horrible in comparison. Um, but this has a price. Um, now, this retails in Switzerland for 3,020 francs. In the States, the uh, recommended price is uh, 2,199, if I remember rightly. Um, which is a lot. The base rifle that this is based on is the uh, CTR, the um, uh, Compact Tactical Rifle, 20 inch. I forgot to mention this is a 20 inch barrel. Um, Tika makes CTRs in 20 and 24 inch lengths. And uh, they retail in Switzerland for about 1500 and in the States for about 1200. Um, you're paying a lot. I mean, the base rifle is, has a plastic bolt handle, it's blued rather than stainless. This is all stainless. Then you've got the special sights. Th these sights are basically extremely expensive. And I think that, uh, that they're adding a bit of cool factor because of the Canadian Rangers link. Um, if you were to put a poor man's version of this together from a base CTR and put uh, the standard Tika grey laminate stock on it, um, you can't get the sights separately, which I think they've done deliberately. Um, you can get functionally similar sights, but which don't have the, uh, the elevation drum on them. Uh, I'm still about 800 francs, $800 short of, uh, of the asking price for this. So, um, yeah, we might have a look in the future. What would you have to do if you wanted something that was functionally equivalent to this, but didn't cost an arm and a leg? Now... I think that the accessories pack is a bit of a shame for a rifle that costs so much. The Canadian Rangers themselves, they get an airline approved hard case, big Pelican case, custom molded for it. They get a soft case for use in vehicles. Uh, they get a sling, sort of two inch or inch and a half wide nylon sling with a, with a movable shoulder pad. Here you get what you saw there, no more, no less. Now the point on the length of pull, okay, I'm sitting at a table here. Oh, that's like butter is that I'm nowhere near bonking my nose here. And even if I, I were to get down behind it, I'm only just, even with my broad shoulders and long arms, I think that's long enough. I was expecting this to be quite a lot shorter. So uh, yeah, we're gonna do some uh, work with this on the range. Its first outing is gonna be at 300, uh, 300 meters. I'll probably put that up in an extra video launched on a on a Sunday, we'll see what it can do. I will, of course, be mad minuting it. We need to find out if it is a uh, good successor to uh, the number four. And uh, if it was me designing this, what would, have I, what would I have done different? And I think so far, the only thing I'd have done different is have a top handguard and a band, but I don't think 
for a hunting slash survival rifle that this is uh, really necessary. But it's just it's just one of my uh, one of the things I like on a rifle. But uh, yeah, I think the hype is real. Um, weight wise, it's a couple of hundred grams lighter than a number four. It's shorter than a number four. It's more accurate than a number four. It's a, it's a different generation technologically. And uh, Tika guarantee these to be five shot minute of angle capable or better with factory match ammunition straight out of the box. So we shall uh, see what I can do on the range with it. So there you go. I hope that was at least vaguely interesting. Thank you so much for watching and uh, please like and subscribe. And uh, if you haven't become a patron yet, please consider doing so. Uh, links in the description below. And uh, it is literally Patreon money that makes this possible because I could not have justified this without. This would have been divorce fodder. Anyway, see you again sometime. Bye.